I enjoyed this book very much. Um, it is a sort of what I call a docu-historama. Uh, it is based in documentary evidence, but there is also a departure from fact, just to make the story a little more meaty, I think. America's First Daughter was written by Stephanie Dre, who is a former teacher and attorney, and Laura Cammy, who is a PhD in history and is a former associate professor of history at the U.S. Naval Academy. And so this book is categorized as historical fiction. Their newest co-authored book is called My Dear Hamilton. And, you know, we, I reviewed the Hamilton book a little earlier, so I, I, don't, I don't think that the new book is a whole lot different from this one in terms of the way uh, it's put together. Both the authors freely admit that they've manipulated Martha Jefferson Randolph and her family somewhat by placing the heroine where she wasn't, um, indicating that certain things happened when they didn't, uh, featuring Patsy as the person who discovered a spy in the Jefferson's household in Paris, uh, asserting a theory about a murder, a murder that goes unproven even today, and uh, they shifted the Colonel Randolph character into a villain when in fact he was just simply not a nice person. The novel is based on Thomas Jefferson's letters, of which there are some 18,000, and adjusted to the needs of today's readers. So they've removed some of the uh, 17th century language. Uh, it's a little more stilted than perhaps our communication might be today. So it rings true then for the 21st century reader. Uh, told by, uh, by Martha Jefferson Randolph in the first person, the novel begins with Jefferson's death and she reflects and reminisces about events that are recounted in the novel. And she's sorting through her father's papers, carefully editing, um, removing and destroying those documents which do not reflect well on him. And so that's an interesting uh, perception to remember as you're reading the novel. Uh, it's, it's not altogether true, it's not altogether false. She says, I am a daughter who must see to it that he is remembered exactly the way he wanted to be. I recall the instructions he'd written for his tombstone, and not a word more. And if you go to Monticello today, you can go to the grave site and look at the marker which has exactly um, his chosen epitaph on it. She goes on, it is why I light the wick of a candle in one of the holders, ingeniously and somewhat dangerously fastened to the arms of my father's chair, and with shaking hands I hold one of his sacred letters above the flame. In so doing, I feel the heat as if a prelude to hell's fires awaiting me. But I've defied God before. My heart is already heavy with sins and secrets and betrayals. I'm stained with the guilt of slavery. I have counted as a necessary sacrifice the blood of patriots. I've denied the truth written upon my old skin and my own skin in the black and blue ink of bruises. I have vouched for the character of men without honor. I have stayed silent to avoid speaking the truth. What is one more silence when it preserves all we have sacrificed for? That will be my legacy, the service I render to my country. For now, I'm not only my father's daughter, but also a daughter of the nation he founded. And protecting both is what I've always done. The novel then transitions to 1781 Virginia during the Revolutionary War. Uh, Patsy, along with her father, mother, and siblings, must take flight from Monticello because British troops are coming to seize Jefferson. Aided by William Short, a distant relative and a staunch abolitionist, they escape. Uh, shortly thereafter, on her deathbed, Martha makes 10-year-old Patsy promise to watch over and protect the family. And uh, that's, a, that's a heavy promise to exact from a 10-year-old. And it kind of um, emphasizes the idea that, um, you know, by the 1920s, people actually uh, didn't want to put those kinds of burdens on their children and wanted them to actually have childhoods. And earlier times, uh, children were looked at as miniature adults, very often uh, charged with very serious responsibilities 
uh, for their family and for their home. We ought to have left them alone, but none of us could move. We were all of us riveted by my mother's every halting word. She drew back and lifted three shaking fingers, spreading them for my father to see. Three children we still have together, she said with great difficulty. I cannot die happy if I know my daughters must have a step mother brought in over them. A sound of anguish escaped my father's throat as if he couldn't bear the thought of another woman. There was no hesitation in him when he took my mother's limp hand to make his solemn vow, only you, Martha. I swear I'll have no other wife, only you. A few years later, Jefferson is appointed as a diplomat to France and leaves for Paris, accompanied by Patsy and their relative, William Short. Patsy is now 15 years old, uh, living as a debutante, uh, as a convent-educated girl, experiencing Paris, its lush sights, and also witnessing the early stages of the French Revolution. In a quite romantic telling, Patsy and William fall in love, but she declines to marry for it would prevent her from keeping her promise and aiding her father's career. Her sacrifice to protect her family comes before all else, as we shall see. Until that moment, I didn't know I had the capacity for coercion. But Mr. Short brought out a great many things in me that I didn't know were there. Since you're so concerned that the matter must wait until my father's return, I'll simply write him about it. Mr. Short turned to me with an expression of astonishment at my threat. And to think everyone who meets you praises you as such a good-natured, happy girl with the charm of a perfect temper. Everyone from Abigail Adams to the nuns at your convent assure your father that you're a girl with the utmost simplicity of character. He gave a rueful laugh. None of them knows you in the slightest. I took instant offense. I behave as Papa wishes me to behave. And he knows you least of all. You're his Amazon, disguised as an angel. At the same time, Patsy figures out that um, Sally Hemings, who's been sent to take care of them and serve as their uh, maid, um, Patsy realizes that her father is sharing a deeper relationship with Sally, um, a slave who also happens to be Martha Randolph Jefferson's half-sister. Free in Paris, Sally negotiates a return to Virginia, protecting herself and her future children. It is during both sisters' bout with typhus, that is, uh, Patsy and Polly, coupled with the discovery that Patsy recognizes her father's affair and his humanity rather than simply idolizing and romanticizing him. Sent away from their convent school back to the Jefferson family lodging in Paris to recover from their typhus, uh, Patsy does a fine job, recovers in uh, general completely, while Polly isn't quite herself as a result of her disease. Patsy then asks her father to allow her to take vows as a nun affiliated with the convent school providing her education. He pinched the bridge of his nose as if the question gave him great pain. Patsy, you're young and inexperienced. This decision needs more time and consideration, mature reflection. His words were unbearably familiar. They sounded like Mr. Short's description of his own conversation with Papa, which also turned on the subject of youth and inexperience. And heat crawled up my neck. My father and I seldom spoke in open disagreement, only circling about subjects of contention without touching them directly. Yet this time I felt as if he allowed me no av avenue of retreat, excuse me. And for once I just said what I believed. I'm old enough now to judge my own happiness. My father took a long drink before returning his glass to the table beside his stuffed chair. He squinted, lines of hurt etching his face. How can you think to be happy separated by an ocean from your sister and me? I'd expected him to be angry. Instead, he was wounded, yet I bristled defensively. I could ask the same of you. 
Don't you intend to leave us in Virginia and return to France? Why would you wish to take the veil? Papa liked to have an iron discipline over himself. He never raised his voice, seldom let emotions rule. But now, to my horror, that self-control cracked, and all traces of the seasoned diplomat, the dispassionate philosopher, the objective scientist fell away. Tears sprang to his eyes as he beseeched me. Have I failed you so utterly as a father? So you want to think a little bit about how difficult it might have been to have been raised Protestant and for, for your daughter to decide that she wants to go back to the Catholic Church in a convent in France, well away from Virginia. The novel covers parts of the alliance built between General Lafayette and the Jeffersons, as well as the call for a French Republic, the influences of the Enlightenment, the diplomacy of the ballroom, and Patsy's responsibilities as first daughter. The novel pushes the concept of the French Revolution as born in Jefferson's parlor. So he's an instigator even there. As fascinating as it all is, Patsy is left behind by her suitor, William Short, who fears he cannot wait for her. He is making alliances of his own, while Patsy finds distraction in dancing with young men from very powerful French families. Although there are a series of romantic interludes in the novel, the bottom line for Patsy is that she has to choose between being the first daughter and becoming a young wife. Patsy asserts that William can wait for her, but he says he cannot, and the Jeffersons prepare to return to Virginia, and Patsy learns further of Sally's negotiations. We've been negotiating a treaty, a treaty. That did sound like my father, the minister to France. Recalling the Duke's wish to make an alliance with me, I could easily imagine Papa condescending to charm his enslaved lover, giving her the courtesies due an ambassador from a foreign land. Oh, I managed weakly. She lifted her chin, a hint of pride there. Your father promises that if James goes back and teaches someone else all he's learned in the kitchens of Paris, He'll go free. And if I go back, your father will keep me and care for me, well, till his death. He'll free my babies, too, when they turn 21, upon his solemn oath. Babies. As if there would be more. As if they meant to carry on indefinitely. I nearly slapped her. My anger was so volcanic that it burned incoherent thought from my mind. I wasn't even sure why I was so angry, only that I was. You want to be a slave all your life, Sally? Past my strangled fury, I choked out, you want to be my father's whore? She brushed the wetness of her eyes away as if it pained her for me to see her cry. How am I to leave my family in Virginia, Miss Patsy? Never see my mama again? Knowing your father wants me, how could I refuse? He's good to me, and I hate nothing like disappointing him. It hurts to disappoint him. Who knew the truth of that statement better than I did? And yet, I stood there, shaking with fury at her choice that I couldn't comprehend, biting the insides of my cheeks to keep from howling with it. It was a wrong choice. Could she not see it? You're giving up your freedom. Sally's shoulders fell, and for just a moment, sympathy pierced my anger. She'd be with child in a city full of upheaval with no one to rely upon but her brother. But then she said, in marriage, man and woman become one, and that one is the husband. Did she think of herself as my father's wife? The very thought of it sent fire through my blood anew and made sense of my rage. It sounded as if she believed what passed between her and my father was a lifelong sacrament when it was nothing but sin. And while I stood there wondering how to tell her that she'd never replace my mother, she straightened her shoulders and she said, he loves me, Miss Patsy. Back in Virginia, shortly before Christmas, Patsy finds that Monticello is dilapidated and hasn't been well kept uh, during the six years there away, and the renovations that were started were not completed. Two, she notices that the indoor plumbing Paris offered was not available to her. The simple luxury of hot chocolate is missing as well. Patsy is not in charge of her own life, as she soon discovers. And her father has invited a gentleman, 
the most eligible bachelor amongst the Virginia gentry educated at Edinburgh to their mountain to meet Patsy. I want to kiss you, he replied hoarsely. I want very much to kiss you and beg your leave to do so. My heart be kicked up in offense. Tom, we scarcely know each other. To the contrary, we've known each other since we were children, but we're not kids anymore. I'm 21 and you're 17 and there's nothing to stop us from doing as nature demands. As nature demands? I told myself that Tom's sudden interest in me had to do with his admiration for my father. I told myself that by my indifference to him, I'd inadvertently set myself up as the fox to his hound. But I think the truth was that his blood ran hot at the sight of me, sad and helpless and mired in the snow. And another truth was that his lustful gaze promised me obliteration, obliteration of thought, of pain, of doubt. So Patsy marries her maternal cousin, doubly confused by the traditions of Virginia versus the idealism of France, which rejected the practice of slavery. Thomas Mann Randolph Jr. attempts to remove himself from his father's cruel influence, while Jefferson reminds Patsy of the sacrifices wives make once they're married. Jefferson then serves as a surrogate father to Randolph while the young man attempts to become successful and deserving of a wife such as Patsy. During this part of the novel, readers find that Tom becomes a congressman and Jefferson is elected president. Patsy's life as a wife and daughter requires her to guard the secrets of both men and protect their reputations. She recognizes the deceitfulness of this role. She watches her father's relationship with Sally deepen yet again, while she still destroys letters and other evidence, an assignment that is made difficult by the several children Jefferson has had with Sally. Patsy even commits perjury in court to maintain the good reputation of the family. The novel points out that in Virginia, men would die for honor while women would lie for honor's sake. Bearing the weight of her guilt, Patsy is determined to honor the promise that she has made to her mother. Finally, recognizing Patsy's farm wife work by seeing the condition of her hands made rough and haggard by blisters and repetitive drudgery, Jefferson proposes that the Randolphs return to Monticello to assist him in maintaining the mountaintop plantation. Papa rescued me by announcing, Tom, I regret imposing upon you, but I find myself in need of a favor. I suppose my appointment to France to be the last public office of my life. However, now my duties will keep me at President Washington's side for an indeterminate time, and it pains me to see Monticello in this rundown state, my people scattered to the winds. The truth was that we would be in his debt. It was an act of generosity, my father wanted to give us somewhere civilized to live while bringing our baby into the world, but in spite of my father's exquisite diplomacy, Tom knew it for what it was. His hand squeezed my shoulder. Mr. Jefferson, he said, his tone just shy of indignant. I don't. I realize, of course, that I couldn't ask you to toil here on my account forever, Papa said quickly, to soothe the stung pride. Not when you want a place of your own, but perhaps in small repayment for your help, I could go to Tuckahoe and talk with your father about securing Edge Hill for you. Perhaps his happy nuptials will put him in a mood to agree. At that moment, the gratitude I felt for my father was sweeter than jelly on fresh bread hot from the oven. For a long moment, Tom didn't reply, and I felt that I might burst in waiting for his answer. Finally, Tom's hand relaxed again, and he gave a small bow. I'm your humble servant, Mr. Jefferson, always. I was to be, for the first time in my life, the mistress of Monticello. The, do the novel does not present things in an improved state necessarily. So really the authors haven't uh, made all of the conflicts and contradictions easy to take. I think it uh, does a really solid job of making a reader uncomfortable when you're dealing with physical abuse, um, uh, death and childbirth, alcoholism, crop failure, slavery, uh, murder mystery, 
um, lack of uh, communication. Despite giving birth to 12 children, Patsy does not have a good relationship with her husband, who becomes more and more like his father, expressing growing resentments, incomplete dreams, um, and generally uh, deporting himself through a fog of drunkenness. Eventually, Jefferson steps in to protect his daughter and granddaughters, or uh, grandchildren, all the while relying on finances provided by their relative, William Short, who has grown wealthy and successful through his work as a diplomat and through his investments. These measures do not last. Uh, and Jefferson continues to mismanage those assets, the land, uh, overspends on things like books and wine, uh, renovation. The Randolphs lose their inheritance when Thomas Mann Randolph Sr. dies, leaving his estate to his latest wife. Patsy endures much, but eventually returns to Monticello and relative sa safety. By 1802, uh, yellow journalism and rumor prevails politically, uh, perhaps not unlike today. And not even Patsy's careful maintenance of the family honor is enough to keep the truth from the public. And so in a variety of ways, uh, Jefferson's life uh, is outed, so to speak. Uh, while Patsy develops a good bit of political savvy, uh, it's beautifully fleshed out in a scene between Patsy and Dolly Madison. And I guess that's the other thing I really like is that you get a, a kind of a portrait of each of these famous people that Patsy interacts with. And uh, you, know, you can uh, maybe convince yourself, if you know a little bit about Abigail Adams or Dolly Madison, that, that, it, that they actually had this particular conversation. I, I can't tell you that they have, but it sure feels good. It sure feels real. Okay. I had my own political instincts. I was accustomed to royal courts, but my father's court wasn't a royal one. Dolly had clearly given great thought to what an American court should be, and I began to do the same. So I set out quite deliberately to befriend the wives of the newspapermen, and at dinner parties amongst hostile Federalists, I, was always sing I always singled out the most belligerent man for my attention and kept him so busy in conversation that he couldn't make mischief. A thing that much impressed Dolly Madison. How is it that you manage to sniff out malice before the troublemakers say a word? I listen to what they do not say, I told her. Papa used these dinners to enforce collegiality by never mixing Federalists and Republicans, limiting the guest list to, a tw to 12 at a round table by keeping ladies present at all times. Your father is very sociable, a man said to me with a wry smile. For a Republican? It was John Quincy Adams, son of the former president. And though he was a Federalist, it wasn't hard to smile at him, given I still harbored affection for his family. To that point, he'd seemed very much ill at ease at my father's table, paying little attention to the chef's creations, but staring longingly at the tray of dried fruit just out of his reach. And because he was the son of Abigail Adams, I was determined to put him at ease. Taking the liberty of slipping an apricot to him, I said, Mr. Adams, I'm afraid I'm old enough to remember a time when there weren't any Federalists or Republicans, a time when we were all simply Americans. Why, it was your very own mother who helped choose my first real dress in Paris. You would have laughed to see the chaos of it. So um, perhaps these ladies uh, who've written the novel have some insight into um, how well women can adjust certain things uh, easily through conversation and uh, charming deportment. Uh, another thing I really liked about the novel is that it was kind of like a, a secret conversation that you have as a reader with Martha Jefferson Randolph. It's kind of uh, fun in that way. You feel like you're part of all of these secrets and whether all of them are pleasing or not doesn't really matter because they're uh, true to life, uh, particularly for the time. Um, and, and just when you think Patsy's going to have a little peace at home and she only has eight children, uh, her husband 
uh, separates himself from her, and yet they have four more children uh, before his uh, uh, ultimate separation from her and then his uh, death. Um, I keep thinking about the distances also between uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., which is not very far, really. It just takes a couple of hours to get there. Uh, but, but you have to remember that you would do that on horseback or in a wagon. Um, when, I, uh, when I studied Texas literature, uh, I think um, I want to say that it was, um, oh, I'm blanking now, so maybe I'm just tired. But uh, it seems to me that it, it took, for the distance between um, The farm outside at uh, LBJ State Park to Fredericksburg took five hours in a buckboard wagon. And so it's not a straight line, right? We have nice sort of pseudo straight highways today. Uh, my, my parents used to tell me when I was a little girl, we'd go to uh, uh, southern Ohio where my dad was raised and all the roads were kind of like this. Uh, but but that would essentially be um, what it would be like because there there are no straight lines. You're gonna uh, you're gonna use the uh, geology and geography of the land itself to determine where your roads are gonna be. And so you want to think about how much time it would take uh, to get from Charlottesville and up the mountain to Washington D.C., which is kind of uh, in a low plain. Um, I would imagine. Uh, maybe they would take two days to get there. And so, you know, when you think about the 15 miles between um, Fredericksburg and the next burg, which is basically, if you've been up that direction, to the herb farm, that would take you five hours. So you, you want to think about how time passes today versus in the past. I just think that's always an interesting thing to try to think about when you're reading historical fiction. Because we're consuming 500 pages pretty rapidly, uh, but, but the time that it takes to actually move through this history would have been uh, a much slower pace than what we're used to. <coughs> when Jefferson returns to Monticello in 1809 as a private citizen, his family is largely dysfunctional. Another war with the British becomes a strong possibility, and by 1814, uh, Washington, D.C. has been burned, including the White House. By February 1815, American confidence is restored. Those citizens, even those as wealthy as the Randolphs and the Jeffersons, are wearing homespun. So no more uh, lush 17th century French clothing um, weaving at home even among the wealthiest families. So that's, a, that's an interesting uh, twist, I guess. In time, Thomas Randolph retires as governor of Virginia, and Patsy and her children have uh, joined her at this point to labor at preserving the family honor. Um, and honestly, you, you read a lot about uh, family complications and the effect of unlimited liquor uh, and its effect on um, uh, people who don't regulate their intake. Uh, so years of embarrassment and humiliation uh, really marks this uh, final portion of the book. And yet, I think you feel that Patsy really does triumph. She uses everything under her control uh, to take care of her family, and in particular, her father's honor. Uh, as you begin the book, she's editing her father's letters. And, and she tells you throughout the book that she does this even before his death, throughout his career. And then you continue to kind of figure out what she's really doing. And uh, I would say, you know, given we're looking backward at events that happen to all sorts of people in their pasts and we're um, applying the lens of the 21st century, 
it might really be difficult indeed to read some of those documents if we still had them today. So she leaves us with a very strong definition of her father, but I think there's probably some uh, pointy edges uh, that she's excised through this editing. And uh, it's not like she's marking through anything. She just burns the letters that she's uncomfortable with. Uh, I would say throughout history, that may be one of the most powerful perspectives of any editor uh, or biographer. And uh, though today probably biographers don't uh, edit those materials, I would say 200 years ago, 250 years ago, probably so. So when you study history, I think most professors tell you, you know, you want to take it with a grain of salt. We can tell you what we think happened, what is documented to have happened, but all of the um, intervening information, uh, we don't know too much. What these two writers do is recreate that for you, um, and it's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. They keep you drawn into the book, and about the time you're tired from something that's happening, then there's a little respite, and you, uh, you go into a new perspective in the book itself. Um, I would encourage you to, if you haven't yet, pick up the book and have a read. Um, there are some conversations with these two writers available online. If you uh, like to kind of fill in the gaps by uh, looking at interviews with writers. Um, I didn't do that. I try not to do that until I'm done. Because uh, I don't want to bring what they say necessarily into what I have to say. I'll do that later. But I know they're out there. And honestly, uh, both of these uh, women are really quite extraordinary scholars in their own right. And so when you, when you read a document that is fiction, but written by people who have uh, great educations and they fact check, and then they admit to you where they've manipulated things, I think that you get a much stronger understanding why it needed to be adjusted but also that they're really trying to tell the truth in a way that we can understand today. I, and honestly, I haven't read all the primary documents. I've read a lot of them, mostly Jefferson's notes on um, the state of Virginia, which I don't know how many times I've studied American literature, but you just really get into that because he uh, he, he defines the landscape um, and also um, the thinking processes, which are really interesting for the time. So the ways that philosophy appeals to people during Jefferson's time is quite different from today. Um, In time, Thomas Randolph retires as the governor of Virginia. Um, and um, I, I don't know too much about him as a governor, but there are not a lot of positive adjectives uh, applied to him as he ages. And further, um, he seems very disturbed by uh, sort of long-lasting wrongs done to him by uh, a father uh, who disconnected from his children. Uh, Jefferson dies in 1826, and Patsy maintains her calm exterior long enough to make it through the funeral rites. Um, her husband dies in 1828, and later she goes on to serve as uh, uh, Jackson's first lady for social events. Uh, she is the grand editor of uh, Thomas Jefferson's primary uh, letters, and uh, she is as tough, intelligent, and honorable as her father and her traditions require her to be. Um, and a fascinating read, I think, um, for women to read about really strong, passionate women from the past is gratifying, um, but also it's a way of, of women not being left out of that history. And you know, I, I tell my students all the time, well, none of us would be here without women. And so we must think that of all famous uh, characters in history as well. 
Um, somebody teaches them, you know, like all of us were taught, our mothers picked us up and started talking to us and cooing at us. And if you had siblings, they helped. Uh, and so that whole family structure uh, that helps to establish what we do and how we do it, what kind of backbones we have, um, certainly comes forward in the novel. I, I really enjoyed the read. Um, it's nice to speculate. And in all those years that I'd speculated about Martha Jefferson Randolph, you know, what kind of person could she have been? Was she really very stuffy? It feels like she has uh, a, a good perspective on how to control herself and yet also there are passages where the humor really is what uh, allows you to keep moving through and and from one um, difficult passage to something funny then you're heartened and you keep going um, so I'm, I'm happy to uh, report that I read it probably three times without any hesitation uh, this is not a book that stops you, and you know, sometimes they can get a little sticky, and you just and you think I got, I just have to put that down. Well, that was not what happened to this book. So uh, three reads, the last one about two weeks ago. Um, it, it's uh, uh, really interesting, and also I would say um, the way that Dre and uh, Cami choose the language is also uh, a, a very positive reflection. It's not 18th century language, but they do maintain a certain formal perspective, and they also are very frank, which certainly during the time, uh, unless it was a group of women gathered together, would not necessarily be the case. Have you had any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, the uh, letters that she uh, seems to quote at the beginning of, of chapters uh, have the ring of truth about them. As best you can yes. tell, are they actual quotes from letters that, uh, where the yes. language seems authentic, you know, 18th century? Yeah, for the most part, yes. Yeah. So they have standardized spelling and um, punctuation for us. But I like, uh, she he chose sections of the letters that it kind of, in a circumlocutious way, uh, implied certain risque things that she was wanting to make a little more obvious to the to the modern 21st century reader. You yes. know, and I, it yeah. was, uh, I thought that was very interesting. I I did wasn't able to plow through the whole book. I mean, it was it, it's dense and it was long to me. Uh, but uh, the part about when the years he was president. I was troubled with the fact that they didn't have convenient dates, or she didn't put dates in there. I would have, I would have liked that. When, <laughs> what were the year, his actual years of president? Was it 18, 1800 to 1808? Was he had a two yes, year, two yes. term? Yeah. Was and, that and, but that's a long time, and it seems like the book doesn't devote all that much space to the time he was president. I think what they tried to do was sort of um, work with her life primarily and to compress the presidential period because we've all probably read a lot about that. And so rather than compete with what we all learned in history class, they, you know, they kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of an impressionism of that period. Now, uh, Dolly Madison was a famous first lady. Did they go into, she had kind of some kind of a connection with Dolly Madison apparently later on. Yeah. Is, is that, yeah. Well, that, that she, you know, that she had um, friendships across uh, generations with um, women. And, and, you know, there I'm sure could be worse influences than Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison. It kind of, this book kind of reminded me of that old show that uh, Walter Cronkite used to have, You Are There. It fascinated me when I was a little kid. I'd just sit on the floor right, like right in front of the TV and, wow, he's got Columbus. And, you know, all these people who couldn't live at the same time, but the actors maintain a really strong association with the biographies that we were familiar with at that point. And, and it kind of feels like that to me, that they're really trying to share something that may or may not be entirely true, but 
to, to allow us into that kind of idea. I liked it. But I liked, you know, I like to read. This is kind of, it's not that hard. <laughs> I tell my students all the time, that's eh, 200 pages, not that big a deal. But, uh, you know, a history, 500 better, you know, 500 or more pages. It's pretty daunting whether it's historical fiction or whether it's kind of a, you know, like Bruce Caton's works on the on the Civil War. It's a hard read. So the other thing in the in the time we are in today, there's more of a broader focus on the world and a broader perspective of the important people and figures in the overall span of American history from the very beginning, you know, Columbus or even earlier, you know. Uh, and on into the modern era. And, and this book is kind of what I might call the Borglum view. You know, the Borglum, the famous sculptor sure. who did Mount Rushmore. Sure. Uh, you know, when you read some of the stuff in the book, you think, well, how did Thomas Jefferson get, make the cut, you know, to be on uh, Mount Rushmore with, with the, certain, the criticisms and so on. But when you think about it, when you, if you were an artist working and choosing, uh, the, the great names to pick from like the 20s or the early 30s or whenever it was he was he was making those picks uh, there you know maybe as a competitor John Adams was close but there just wasn't anybody well, who else could they have picked they I'm had not Grover they, Cleveland no not <laughs> no all these people they, they were, there was there Washington uh, Lincoln and, and Jefferson and and I think Teddy Roosevelt yeah. you know and uh, they, he, he did about the best, the, pick the best, you know. But now today, uh, we were recently at uh, Austin Seminary, and the, some of the speakers were saying today, you know, if they were doing Mount Rushmore now, you know, they might have MLK on their trips, <laughs> you know, and, you know, just other sure. Columbus, or they might have a, a, a whole wider range of, of people to pick. Be different, yeah. And you know, Borglum did some work here in San Antonio. Yeah, there's a beautiful studio on the Brackenridge Golf Course, yeah. at the, at the Gaborgum studio. So you can, when you go to um, the uh, Rushmore, you, they have the um, studios open there. You can go down into them and they'll have a, a speaker to, you know, kind of review what really happened there and um, the link to which they went to get the work done and you know, what the dynamiting was like. It's really kind of fascinating. Uh, and then you can also see the work that's being done elsewhere in the Black Hills to uh, commemorate other famous Americans. Anybody? Yes? I was really intrigued with the artistry that they used in time race relations between continents and periods yes. and the, the, the kind of the trap of economic success that was based on slavery and yes. the rationale of some of the younger people her age who wanted to have only something they could take care of themselves right it was it, i thought they just very artful and not absolutely just in virginia but in yes as well the and the yeah i think the european perspective is really interesting and you know the there's a little film called jefferson in paris that is quite exquisite and and the actor that portrays Jefferson I'm not going to tell you who it is because you just won't be able to believe it you should you should watch it. it'll it be on Netflix it's not going to be expensive um, uh, Jefferson in Paris is a real eye-opener and I had to work really diligently to not hear um, Gwyneth Paltrow's voice in my head when I was reading Patsy uh, because I, I've seen that film several times, it's really well done. And the actress who does Sally Hemings is uh, not only quite beautiful, but very gifted. And the, she has a dialogue in that film with her brother James about why not to come back to the United States, or to, to America. Um, and, and he says, well, quite frankly, I'm not accountable to anybody, I just have to be a good chef. And, uh, you know, it. That film brings it home, but, but this book constantly re reminds us what's going on on Jefferson's Mountain mm -hmm. and who's responsible. And, you know, on one level, um, yeah, 
having a nail factory is a great thing and teaching people to have a trade is a great thing, but who does it serve? It only serves um, the owner. And so that's, that's troubling. The, this well, that's a thing of our people. You've got to take care of our people. Our people. people. And there's always in the back of that. Who is that? Yeah. Uh, and at the base of the mountain, they've got a, a little museum that you can go to, and they have a wall of honor. And it's all the descendants of the slaves that were on the Monticello estate and portraits of uh, these descendants. And so, I mean, people are dressed in all kinds of military uniforms um, with all kinds of great appointments. I mean, it's a fascinating, it's not a very big museum, but it's really fascinating as you go in there to really see um, what that, that body of, people brought forth for the country and all of them serving in a variety of different roles teachers doctors uh, military officers commissioned officers non-commissioned i mean they are in their uh, dress uniforms in these portraits um, commemorated by one organization or another and it's quite fascinating to see that you know when you look at the descendants of the people of that mountain um, the larger effect is definitely from the descendants of the slaves. It's a, it's, it's really, I think, an important. They don't say that to you, but I think it's an important experience when you uh, go to look at Monticello, because it's just beautiful and fascinating and amazing. And my mother told me the first time I went there, I had nothing. I did not want to go in the building because there was a lady outside in an antebellum gown, mm -hmm. and she had kittens in a basket. And I was on, no, six. So I was after those kittens. And how do you keep your dress like that? <laughs> but I've, I've been to Monticello many, many times, and uh, it's one of the places I like to go back to. And I never know how much I want to go back there until I'm back there. Um, the other thing is, they, you know, you can um, buy seeds. They have heirloom seeds that they cultivate in the gardens. They won't feed you. Uh, but you can buy seed, you can see what the uh, recreative employees are doing, they have all sorts of roles um, in that um, uh, internationally recognized uh, historical site. And you know, when I was a little kid, the, it was the uh, Virginia Historical Commission that still had it. And so the changes that have been able to be made um, since a, a larger organization is at the heart of it. It's been really fascinating. But you can see where Jefferson looked down the hill at the University of Virginia. Um, you can see, you know, how far it is to get to the river where they uh, cracked the ice to put in the ice houses. Uh, it's, it's not very far at all, but it's really quite beautiful. And uh, um, they also have a, like a 17th century uh, stagecoach inn. And you can go down there and they make fried chicken for you. They'll make you weep. <laughs> well, that's how they keep people coming in there. Um, and uh, my husband and I were there in 2000. It wasn't raining here at all. And we came out of that restaurant and it was raining in the parking lot. So we were dancing in the rain. And all these people are standing up on the porch like, look at those crazy people out there. It doesn't rain where we live. <laughs> so actually being wet from the rain, I mean, it was a whole, it was a whole kind of uh, amazing thing. And we drove there in the dark, so you didn't see any grand presentation. So the next morning we get up and, and drive to the mountain, and wow, it was, uh, it was uh, really profound. Um, you know, I think uh, if we study Jefferson a little bit, he's, he's got a lot of uh, conflicts and contradictions in his own self, and hence his children have them as well. What's right, what's wrong? Um, uh, how, how do we maintain what we've been taught to do? Uh, what is honor? Um, how does our definition of honor change when we think about slavery and the effects of slavery and the idea that um, uh, we, we see an example of a family that makes themselves very wealthy as a result of uh, 
other people's labor for which they are not compensated. And it's the, it's the women who, on their deathbed, are concerned with the legal protection of their children. Yes. To exact that deathbed promise of not marrying. Yes. Not legally. Yeah. Not and, taking and, someone else. And I think this is maybe the best def or the the best discussion of that I've ever read. I. Uh, you know, for a long time, I, I felt like that was really a manipulative act, and then, um, well, it was. The, it hopefully was absolutely <laughs> manipulative, but but just sort of exclusively. And then the explanation in the novel is that you know this is a maternal, maternally motivated concern. This is not about oh, I love you too much for you to ever marry again. Don't don't do that to my kids. Um, reflective of Bradstreet's. Anne Bradstreet's poetry where she says, do not inflect a stepdame on my children. And you know, she's very rare. Uh, Bradstreet is actually able to raise all eight of her children to adulthood in Puritan times, which is almost impossible. So you know, you, you have to learn something from the stick to of our historical ancestors, at least in terms of our founding mothers. Uh, and what they, what they do behind the scenes, which is uh, very often a role that women uh, take. And so we're just sharing it differently these days. Everybody kind of takes those supportive roles. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you so much.